I'm excited to talk to all of you. It's amazing that even with coronavirus, we've had such good uh, participation in these lectures, and I hope that I can discuss some of the research that we've been doing on exceptional aging and mechanisms underlying exceptional aging. So before I begin, I just briefly want to talk about the program focus that we have. In my group, we look at PET and MRI imaging technologies, and our goal is to develop acquisition, processing, and quantification methods in order to measure earliest changes that happen to the brain because of aging and pathologies. And first and foremost of, of all these comes that how do lifestyle factors prevent these changes? And our goal is to understand the mechanisms behind these. This is the overview of the things I'm gonna talk about. First, I'll talk about cognitive aging in the population and how uh, we can investigate mechanisms that can lead to exceptional aging, the other side of cognitive aging, prevent sharp decline in cognition with age. And I'm gonna talk about studies that fall into three broad mechanisms, reserve, resistance, and resilience. This is how cognitive aging in the population looks. With age, there's a dramatic decline in memory, speed, reasoning, and visual spatial skills. And this decline over time ultimately puts individuals at the risk of Alzheimer's disease dementia. And uh, if you look at the figures of people who actually have an estimated lifetime risk of Alzheimer's disease, it's about 10 to 20% of men and women. And our goal is to understand this process what is causing the cognitive aging process and how do we prevent it or delay it? There are three uh, aspects of cognitive aging. One is underlying pathological processes. There are several pathological processes ha that happen in the brain with aging, but about 90% of cognitive decline that we see in the population is because of Alzheimer's disease pathologies and cerebrovascular disease pathologies. Uh, many of you might know that Alzheimer's disease pathologies include abnormal deposition of amyloid beta protein and tau protein, and cerebrovascular disease is much more heterogeneous with a significant amount of white matter changes, microinfarcts, infarctions, you see microbleeds as, you, as individuals age, so this varied amount of pathologies, but these two classes of pathologies probably cause 90% of cognitive decline when you look at the population overall. The, these pathological changes cause change in brain structure and function. On the left is a brain of an individual who is normal at the age of 70, and at, at the right is a brain of an individual who has significant brain structure and function uh, decline over time because of various pathological processes that occur. And ultimately, the pathology causing brain structure and function changes causes cognitive decline. And individual who's 80 year old in our study, if the individual did not have Alzheimer's disease or cerebrovascular disease pathologies, they're relatively stable when you follow them for a very long period of time. But if the individual at 80 years of age and who is cognitively normal has both Alzheimer's disease and cerebrovascular disease pathologies, they rapidly decline. And this decline is what ultimately moves individuals from being unimpaired, cognitively unimpaired, to being impaired. The studies that I'm gonna to present today are from Mayo Clinic Study of Aging. I'm, uh, I'm one of the imagers there, and our goal is to recruit individuals across the lifespan and collect rich imaging, neuropsychological assessments, and lifestyle assessments to really understand what's happening over the uh, entire life's course. So it's a longitudinal study and individuals who are 70 plus have significant amount of follow-up. But what we have learned in the last 20 years looking at the data is that there's significant heterogeneity in the cognitive aging process. I don't age like someone else. And there, even within groups of individuals, there's significant amount of heterogeneity of how people perform, how their brain looks, and how, uh, how much, uh, neurobiological capital they have. For the sake of uh, understanding, in my research, we bin everything in, into three categories. One is pathologies. Does someone have pathologies or not? Do they have AD pathologies, cerebrovascular disease pathologies? And then 
The second question we ask is, how much brain structure or function do they have? How much capital in their bank do they have to resist pathologies or avoid the pathologies or cope with pathologies you have? Is the brain structure function high or is it low? The third question we ask is, irrespective of pathologies, are individuals performing well? Despite of everything, are they coping with pathologies well? That's an important question we need to ask because some individuals have a head full of amyloid. About 30% of cognitively unimpaired individuals have head full of amyloid Alzheimer's disease pathologies and they're completely normal. Why is that so? So it's important to understand the mechanisms that help them stay, stay cognitively normal. So now we delve into the, into the topic we're all interested in, how do we understand mechanisms? And the way we need to look at mechanisms is that we ask specific questions. What is causing the heterogeneity and what causes the heterogeneity and how are people able to stay cognitively unimpaired even when they're eight years old and they have uh, several uh, vascular and Alzheimer's disease related changes. So for my uh, understanding, it's easy to bend them into three categories, the mechanisms, reserve, resistance, and resilience. I'm going to I'm going to talk you through each one of these and how studies can be designed to investigate these mechanisms. But I'm, I welcome questions at the end because it's an ongoing conversation in the group, uh, within our group, across, uh, across the world, and the professional interest area group that I am part of to understand these mechanisms and how do we go about it, designing a good study to be able to do that. So let's talk first about reserve. Uh, the concept of reserve which and the definition of reserve that we rely on heavily on is from the white paper published by Yakov Stern, which was an effort of the group that uh, that's most of the people are on the call today. And the idea is that the individuals have different amounts of reserve. There's significant variation in the amount of capital that individuals have that will allow some people to better cope with brain aging and pathology. So, Every person in the population has different amount of reserve. And how do you measure it? And what does it actually mean? This is the question we asked in the first paper, where we asked the question, can we say something about the individual variation of reserve in midlife? It is well known in the literature that there are no substantial brain pathological changes in individuals who are less than 65 years of age. So we focused on individuals who are between 50 and 65 years of age and said, can we measure reserve in, these, in midlife? And how does this reserve vary? What really influences this reserve? How, how can we determine how much amount of money I have in the bank, my brain bank, at the age of 65, so I'm ready to face pathological changes? So that was the question we asked, and Brian Nett uh, beautifully put this paper together. And we looked at several metrics of brain health. We looked at the structure, we looked at microstructural integrity, and we looked at metabolism, the function. And we looked at a variety of factors in individuals' life. How much, what was their education level, the job they were doing, the physical cognitive activity engagement in the last 12 months, and how they were doing, about, what, what were they were doing about it. And also we looked at the general health factors. How many cardiovascular and metabolic conditions do they have? Did they have a stroke before the age of 65? What is their BMI? How, is, how are their glucose levels, smoking, alcoholism? And we also looked at depression index. And we basically asked the question, how does brain health vary as a function of these risk factors in midlife? And what we found was rather interesting. We found that general health status was the largest contributor of better brain health in midlife. So more than what people had, more than education, occupation, physical activity, their general health, how they were taking care of their health, their vascular risk conditions, smoking was a biggie. And uh, it was very surprising that it was the largest contributor among all the health factors that we looked at. And uh, subsequently, we're working on a study, what does this high reserve mean? Let's say you started out with more money in the brain bank. How does it help you? And we are seeing that more in your brain bank at midlife means that you're able to cope with age and patho pathological changes better over time. So if you follow individuals over several years, they have better outcomes just because they start higher, irrespective of what they face after the age of 65. 
I wanted to, this is unpublished data, but I wanted to really showcase this because we, all of us in, uh, around the world, we focus on gray matter a lot and we seldom don't understand the importance of white matter, which we're increasingly finding that it is super important. In this study, uh, Constantinos found that, this is part of a collaboration, and we found that there is, there is a cluster of individuals. You can see, it's hard to see the details, but you can see cluster four at the very bottom. And you can see that individuals who belong to cluster four seem to be uh, declining much faster. And even though the white matter aging is not related to Alzheimer's disease pathology, this cluster four, even at the age of 60, is extremely vulnerable to lap, rapid cognitive decline over time, showing that measuring white matter as a, as a reserve metric is extremely important. So that was my first mechanism. Uh, next, we move on to the mechanism of resistance and uh, coining of the word, uh, the credit goes to Ader Arneta, who, who along with me, we put together this concept that this, there needs to be a clear distinction between avoiding pathologies and coping to, for coping with pathologies. Resistance, we use the term resistance specifically to, to address the fact of avoiding pathologies and how do you have lower than expected amount of pathology. It doesn't need to be Alzheimer's disease, it doesn't need to be cerebrovascular disease, it could be CP43, Lewy body disease, uh, or uh, preventing a stroke. How are you resistant to certain things? In this stock and my group, we only focus mainly on amyloid, PET, tau, PET, and cerebrovascular disease pathologies on MRI. And what we found was very interesting. If anybody wanted to call for the biggest resistance factor is age. So if you can stop aging, that would be fantastic. But unfortunately, because we can't pause aging, we have to keep looking for other resistance factors that avoid us from, uh, from accumulating pathologies over time. Resistance to amyloid comes from uh, not being an FOE4 non-carrier. This is data on the left from Wa Washington University in St. Louis, and they've shown that FOE4 carriers accumulated a much higher rate than non-carriers. So being an FOE4 non-carrier uh, provides resistance to amyloid. And on the right is data from some of the folks on this call who uh, have shown that FOE2, uh, uh, having an FOE2 genotype, uh, dictates that you have lesser amount of amyloid deposition than the rest of the population. But in terms of how can we resist amyloid, there are several studies going out there. I have to tell you, I, uh, I have published several negative studies where we've not found any association between amyloid and the factors. We recently had a general anesthesia exposure over 20 years of time, and we tried to understand if it influences amyloid, and we found no association, which means it's a negative study, but it influences the brain structure and brain reserve. In terms of amyloid, there are not a lot of factors that influence uh, amyl resistance to amyloid. But one, the only one success story of, out of the 10 stories that we have worked on is that sleep disruption is strongly associated with increased amyloid deposition. This is uh, work done by Diago Caruela from our group, who's, uh, invest, who's been investigating over time how sleep disruption causes increased amyloid deposition. And it's well known by the publication in 20, 2013 in Science that sleep is really important for toxin and metabol metabolite uh, clearance. So we went, went down the route of, can we say something about baseline sleep disruption and what happens to your amyloid accumulation over time? And what we found is extremely interesting. It's that, yes, having poor sleep at the beginning of the study means that you have more amyloid deposition over time over the, over the key regions. Pecunious amyloid load is one of the highest in the, in the, in the brain. And you see an increased deposition in those individuals who, who have poor sleep at the beginning. Moving on to stress, uh, this is one of the first studies that come out, uh, and this is led by Ader Arneta. And the idea here was we wanted to see if stress does anything to your amyloid deposition or tau deposition. One thing we know from all the epidemiological studies is that chronic stress really increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease clinical syndrome. And we wanted to understand, based on the animal studies, that does really high glucocorticoid levels, which drive tau in animals, does the same stand true 
in humans. And what uh, Ader found in his publication is that, yes, people who are amyloid positive older adults who have low stress coping abilities, they show higher tau. Mind you, this is only a cross-sectional studies. This could be a mere um, uh, a reverse causality issue where people are able to cope with stress less if they have more tau. So more studies are needed to really understand the unidirectional relationship between stress and tau depletion. We've also found some evidence that blood pressure fluctuation can, can cause tau deposition. It's supported by some of the studies out there, but I think the association between blood pressure fluctuation and tau deposition is indeed very weak compared to the effect that amyloid or age have on tau. So there is some evidence there, and there is still a story to be told, which is a question that all of us need to think about. Coming to risk factors of cerebrovascular disease, we you can see with the plot here, on the x-axis is age, on the y-axis is the, the, free, the percentage of abnormal white matter you have in the brain. And you can see there's a lot of heterogeneity. You see people who really accru accumulate a lot over time, some people who don't accumulate anything at all. But what we find is the single largest risk factor that determines who has more hyperintensity over time is hypertension. And these results agree with the Sprint Mind study, which have shown that modifying blood pressure has significant impact on white matter hyperintensity. And the other very interesting part from this public, this group of publications has been that being a female puts you at a greater vulnerability of white matter damage, which is extremely interesting. So coming to the last mechanism, so we uh, talked about reserve, which is more of a biological, neurobiological capital, amount of cash you have in your brain bank. We talked about resistance, where we talked about avoiding pathology. The last concept that we work on is resilience. And resilience is uh, equally important, if not more, because resilience are the mechanism, group of mechanisms through which you can cope with pathological changes. For example, you have a, you have a stroke and you still are resilient. You don't decline in cognition over time. Or let's say you're uh, exposed to uh, you have a lot of Lewy bodies and Alzheimer's disease pathologies over time, you're able to cope with those changes without no change in cognition or very little change in cognition. So that is what we call resilience or resilience mechanism. The idea is that you have pathologies, but there are no changes on the downstream processes. It could be that if, you, if you're talking in the, in the context of ATN, it could be that you have amyloid and tau positive, but your neurodegeneration negative, and you don't have any cognitive impairment. That, con that uh, is related to resilience. And why is studying resilience important? Studying resilience is important because if you take an 80-year-old individual in our study with E4 carrier shift, we find that people who have higher intellectual enrichment, let's say they have low education occupation, high education occupation, and high midlife and late life cognitive activity of, over time, the 80-year-old individual is about 10 years away from developing cognitive impairment. The same thing is not true with someone who has low enrichment throughout their life because they're two years away from developing. So understanding these resilience mechanisms is important because we really want to understand how they're able to de delay the onset of cognitive impairment. And this resilience can come from multiple different things. This is one of the studies that we recently published, and the idea was that what makes men and women differently resilient to certain pathologies? And we found that even though tau levels were not different between men and women, men seem to have lower damage at a given level of tau. So if you control the amount of amyloid and tau, the tau-related metabolic dysfunction is much higher in women compared to men, and this can be related to some of the brain architecture differences. And we also, uh, I wanted to briefly touch on two studies where we looked at resilience over time. And this is where the heterogeneity in the population really helps you. In the first study, we looked at 80 plus individuals who maintain cognitive status of normal over two clinical follow-ups. And in the second study, we looked at mild cognitive impaired individuals, individuals who have slower decline or delayed decline over time. And uh, this is a study uh, published by Ader. And in this study, we found that people who are resilient, people who are 80 years or older, even though they have amyloid in their brain, are resilient 
and are able to be cognitively normal over an average of five years because they have greater anterior cingulate metabolism, which is actually driven by, if you look at the middle panel, it is driven by having low cardiovascular metabolic conditions over time, and females seem to have greater amount of metabolism in this region, saying that it is helping individuals stay cognitively stable over time without declining, even in the presence of amyloidosis. And that's a, that was a very exciting study because it agrees with uh, the, the studies published by Yakov Stern about task invariant network, as well as studies uh, led by uh, Geffen and Emily Rogolowski, who, who looked at superagers and they find that the particle thickness in the anterior cingulate is higher, which provides resilience, cognitive resilience to individuals. And this is a study published, uh, submitted by Sheila Raghavan, who is a postdoc in my group. And we been looking at what happens to resilience and mild cognitive impairment impaired patients. And we find that you could be part of any of these graphs. You could be green, blue, black, or red, but people who are more likely to be not declining really fast, mild cognitive impaired subjects who are not declining fast are because they have greater microstructural integrity, especially in the frontal lobes, that makes them more resilient, ability to cope with pathological changes that are happening. Finally, I wanted to talk about how should the field move? Because we talked about mechanisms, study designs that help you determine what kind of mechanisms drive what kind of changes. But uh, because, uh, because all of us have been working on this mechanistic aspect, I think now is the time where we try to move towards integrated models. Because cognitive health is not driven by one mechanism. It's a combination of multiple mechanisms, and I'll give you an example of how one may do it. In this study, we tried to, uh, Tim Lestick and I worked together, and we tried to look at about 1,230 elderly individuals with a lot of follow-up, and we tried to look at their brain, and their brain changes over time, and what causes shrinkage. And we wanted to really do a good job predicting the observed mean. So the data we, uh, we got from these 1,230 individuals is the red curve, and we wanted to do a fantastic job to take the brain health into consideration and build pathways and that can predict the blue curve. And what we found was a little complicated, but the major message was that cognitive aging is a multifactorial process. If we uh, go down to the next, next slide, we see that most of the paths that we looked at all converge to brain shrinkage. So if your brain shrinks, you have greater cognitive decline over time. How why does your brain shrink? Your brain shrinks because you have poor resistance to amyloid. You have higher reserve uh, and resilience, then your brain shrinks less. And that happens if you have better general health and you have better white matter health. And what was very surprising among all these, which was, which really caught us a little bit of off guard was the fact that education occupation, primarily because the, the, Individuals who have higher education occupation probably have better lifestyle and access to healthcare. We found that that is one of the primary driving factors when you look at the reserve and resilience pathways. And we were able to really do a good job at individual predictions where if you look at a male APOE4 non-carrier or a female APOE4 carrier, given their education levels, their current amyloid status, and their white matter health, we were able to do a really good prediction of how fast they were going to decline over time, which is where we really want to get, because we want to prevent that from happening and figure out the mechanisms that can prevent that. In summary, I talked about three things, always three things. Pathology drives brain structure and function changes, which ultimately drives cognitive dysfunction. There are multiple mechanisms, and each of the mechanisms, resistance is avoiding pathology. It helps you understand those mechanisms. Reserve contributes to greater brain structure and function and helps you cope with pathological changes. Resilience is the concept where we, uh, we look at cognitive decline and see how people are able to cope with pathological and age-related changes better. And I hope that the one take home message, if you had to take home from this presentation is that all of us need to start thinking about modeling cognitive aging as a multifactorial process. It's not amyloid alone, it's not vascular disease alone, but it's a, uh, it's a complex collaboration 
multifactorial processes of uh, systemic, somatic, and brain aging. And this is something which will really help us understand the cognitive aging process. I'd like to thank my core team, shown in red, and the collaborators that I have. This wouldn't have been possible without a May Clinic study of aging study participants and family and the Aging and Dementia Imaging Lab and our funding support. And unfortunately, exceptional aging is a lifelong endeavor and it's important to maintain, uh, stay healthy now and always. And it, it cannot be undermined that heart health, systemic health, somatic health, brain health are all important and play an important role in going down the path of exceptional aging. And uh, in, in, uh, in, in the world that we have instant gratification, this is a hard goal to achieve, to ha have it as a lifelong endeavor. But I hope that you understand the importance of uh, maintaining a healthy lifestyle and staying healthy. Uh, as a plug-in, I briefly wanted to say, if we can continue some of these uh, discussion at the virtual event data bits that we plan to have as part of the Reserve Resilience Protective Factors PIA, and please consider submitting abstracts and attending this forum, which uh, we will uh, soon widely uh, publicize. And thank you. This is a great opportunity to be able to present our work and uh, welcome questions. And this is a research is an ongoing implement in concepts and trying to design better studies. So please uh, ask away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Prashanti. Uh, this was an excellent and very inspiring um, talk, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Um, so uh, please, um, if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and switch on your camera and um, ask a question. You can also uh, write me um, a text via the, the chat function. Um, so Prashanti, I may uh, start with uh, a first question. So you pointed out um, different uh, potential factors that contribute to resilience and uh, resistance, including education, so which is kind of fixed constant variable, um, but also time varying uh, variables like uh, sleep uh, disturbance or uh, coping with stress. So putting this in a lifespan perspective, where do you see uh, critical time windows and um, uh, what do you think about the chronicity you know, uh, of these uh, protective uh, factors? So a uh, very important question, Michael. It depends on the population you're interested in. If you had to look at sleep as a preventive strategy, you would probably want to target individuals who are 50 to 65 years of age, that midlife area, who, have, who don't have much of amyloid uh, deposition. If you, you cannot use sleep as a preventive strategy in individuals who already have amyloid. So it depends on the window of time that you want to target. But every age is the optimal age, right? We have learned over and over again that childhood development is so important in terms of frontal, uh, frontal development, better executive function. So every time period is important, but it depends on your target area, people of interest. Resilience mechanisms are more optimal for individuals who are 65 plus, like Gail Shatlet's study, where they're focusing on meditation because it's coping with pathologies, learning a new language, things like that. Like depends on which population is your focus, then you target the preventive strategy that will uh, that will address that particular pathology. Thank you, Prasanti. Okay, please go ahead. Um, anybody else? Sure. Hi. Pradeep. This is yeah. Hi. This is Pradeep. Hi, Prashanti. Fantastic Hi. talk uh, for um, data people like us. This really puts a lot of things in good perspective to focus on important questions. I have actually three, but maybe I'll start with the most important one. I think you touched on a lot of important data sets, right? How much of these analyses were re replicated and how much of these data are open? So we, uh, so first thing is, we are trying to replicate as much as possible. So the, the metabolic uh, signature study that Ader led, that was replicated in ADNI. And uh, so some of these data, set are, uh, data sets are open, some are available upon request. But what I'm more excited about is like there are some new trials in the field 
that really will get into these causal mechanisms that I'm part of, which is one is stroke prevention, which is called discovery, and one is the pointer imaging of the pointer study. So these will really actually get to the fundamentals of uh, these. Uh, we, we come up with these ideas, but to see them in action is going to be exciting. And they will all be open, the new trials you mentioned? Yeah, uh, they will be, some of them will be open and they will be available upon request, yes. If I can ask one more question quickly. Um, sure. The resilience and resistance sounded similar to me. Can you dis distinguish them a bit more? No? Sure. So uh, resistance is avoiding pathologies. You have a beautiful PIB and tau scan, which has no amyloid, no tau. That's resistance. Resilience Sorry, I, meant, is, um, yeah. I meant reserve and uh, the other one. Res yeah. So you said reserve and resilience? There's two second ones, you know, yeah, greater reserve and greater resilience, yeah. Yeah, so there, uh, this is a confusion we all have too. We do use term, but reserve is actually greater capital helps you cope with pathology. So reserve is a part of resilience. For us, uh, reserve, resilience is coping with pathology. Greater reserve helps you with uh, helping cope with pathology. So there, reserve is a mechanism underlying resilience. I, I tried to make the, the distinction between reserve and resilience in our mind, when we say reserve, we always think about starting with a greater amount. But resilience could be could also have active compensation. You know, you can cope by active compensation. It's not what you started with. So that's the slight distinction. Thank, Thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you. We have another um, person who likes to ask a question. David Gazon. Hi. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question regarding the. Um, the, um, yeah, the association that you mentioned between white matter and um, and the risk of cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. So is there a difference between um, this association if you look at gray matter or if you look at overall brain shrinking? Because of course, if the whole brain shrinks and also the white matter matter, the white matter um, volume will shrink and also the gray matter volume will shrink. So is there a um, particular reason to say white matter or? So it's, uh, if I had to describe it in a simple way, right? Gray matter are more like the cities and white matter are more like the roads that connect the cities. The mm -hmm. roads can get damaged. You, it doesn't have to shrink. The roads don't need to shrink down, but they can get damaged over time, right? And there's a clear distinction. It's not the volume that's changing. It's the microstructural integrity that is changing, the myelin structure that's changing with age. And gray matter, the hits that you get on gray matter are with age, right? Like and tau deposition, you have uh, Louis bodies, you have TDP43, those shrink the gray matter. White matter, the, the, there is a subtlety of difference. For example, a white matter attracts connecting different regions and the tracks can be damaged because of vascular disease, nothing to do with pathologies, age-related wear and tear. And that's, a, that's the distinction you have to make. So when you talk about neurodegenerative diseases, you always talk about gray matter, but white matter is more specific to this age-related damage and systemic vascular-related damage. Does that make sense, David? Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Rao. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Please go ahead. Anybody else? Michael, there is a question, uh, I think. Okay, please, please unmute yourself. Was it? Yeah, I can hear you. I think we need to ask Rao to unmute himself. He's asking a question. We yeah, Raul, we cannot hear you. Can you un unmute yourself, please? I think it's at the bottom left. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. So, uh, Raul, while you are figuring this out, let me ask another question, uh, Prashanti. Um, so, you also mentioned the link between uh, vascular pathology and, and uh, tau. Um, so what do you think is the mechanism here? So we saw some evidence from the paper that just came out in Nature, right? Yeah. The blood, yeah. bra blood brain barrier dysfunction, endothelial function damage, probably driven uh, drives some of the tau deposition. Uh, 
still to be seen. Not, no, no solid data yet to prove that. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Raul. Uh, I can hear you, Raul. Yeah. You're unmuted. Yeah. Yes, uh, returning to resistance and resilience, it could be equivalent to what Jacob Stern calls uh, name um, brain reserve and cognitive reserve. One is a, a passive model and the other is an active model. Sure. I think the distinction we were trying to go for is cognitive reserve and brain reserve of Jacob Stern can go into resilience. Both of them help cope with pathologies, but it does not clearly call out how are you avoiding pathologies. So let's not get caught up in the terminologies. When your term might not be the same as my term, but the, prop, the idea we're trying to get across is we really want a distinction between avoiding and coping. When I say education does not resistance, resist against amyloid, avoid amyloid, that's an important concept for me because we have conducted studies over 10 years and really does not avoid amyloid depletion, but it helps with resilience, it helps with coping. That's where we need terminologies, but not necessarily to you know uh, be very stern about it. I'm just trying to explain the results that I have and we have. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Prashanti. Hi, um, can, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Beautiful talk. I really liked it. Um, I was particularly intrigued by um, the finding that, um, or the sex specific difference in the effect of tau on enterinal hypermetabolism. Um, can you speculate about the background? So, what, what might be the driving thing behind that dissociation? So, if you've looked at the men and women architecture over time, mm -hmm. there's a clear difference. So even cognitive function, right? You would agree that women have, I'm going to throw out a, a, a concept that I agree with, that women have better memory. I for sure mm -hmm. have better memory than my husband. So I, <laughs> and a few people I know. So uh, I think there are significant brain architecture differences. Mm -hmm. So for example, the quality of a tract, let's just simply take a quality of a white matter tract. There was a beautiful study from uh, the UK Brain Biobank, and they published that the quality of the tract, how information is passing through, is much more better in men, whereas the complexity of fibers, because they're crisscrossing, meant much more complex, uh, complex architecture in women. In that particular finding that we found, uh, that Vijay Ramanan published, the, the difference comes from the fact that posteriorly, especially in the temporal lobe, there is greater amount of uh, metabolism to begin with in men compared to women. So you start with less versus more, you decline faster, you have less reserve there. But I think it's, uh, I, I was hoping you'd also ask the question, in Ader's study though, we found greater, women were more resilient right? Because they have greater metabolism there. There's so much happening. And unless we really step back and say bird's eye view, I really want to look at how overall everything fits together and how all processes come together to drive cognitive decline. we won't be able to understand the whole concept. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Prashanti. Natalie, go ahead. Hello, hi. Uh, hi, really nice to see you. Uh, nice to see you too. Thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, I'd like to follow up on that last question on the, the sex differences and uh, ask whether because of these differences at a biological level, should we be thinking about um, sex specific interventions? So one specifically targeted for women versus men. That's a great question. And I think that's where the, uh, Natalie, that's where the field is going. Uh, that is where, uh, the field is going. For example, people who are looking at women trajectories over time, cardiovascular, right after menopause in 50s, there seems to be a dramatic vascular hits, right? Why is that women have more hyperintensities? Because it's like very specific. So I, I am 100% sure that, you know, a little while from now, we will be get to, towards trying to re really pinpoint who should we target? And mm -hmm. are there men versus women differences in terms of interventions for sure okay let's talk <laughs> let's talk yes 
Hi, may I ask a question, please? Sure. Uh, well, thank you for the lecture. It was very nice. And I would like to know if uh, have you seen any influence on on the long term on the outcome between patients uh, patients who have a uh, psychiatric illness, especially between, considering the fact that there are different uh, sex types like women and men, and mood disorders are much more prevalent in women. Is there any difference in the long term in the outcome? In, in the cognitive aspect. project, please. That's an, uh, that's an interesting question, but we have not specifically investigated that. But uh, it, there is a model, as, uh, I, I could share it with you. There is a model where they have 21 conditions. The US, it's called DHSS, uh, the, the, it's called multi-chronic condition list, okay? In that seven conditions are cardiovascular metabolic, which cause accelerated aging. And they are around six or seven mental health issues, you know, depression, mm -hmm. all the issues. And all the set of, there are totally 17, I believe, 17 set of conditions that cause accelerated aging. And if you, if you look at what I talked about, it's cognitive aging, right? Cognitive aging is nothing but, and people who de develop dementia is nothing but they've accelerated their process of cognitive aging and end up demented. I'm pretty sure if you put all those conditions and see where they land, I'm sure they'll all change the trajectories. Right. In some Thank you very much. 